changes in matter. There are different kinds of changes we are going to be looking at in class. One of those changes is physical changes. Physical changes are those changes that only change the physical nature of the substance. It's not a permanent change. It changes physical properties of the substance. So things like taking a magic marker and coloring a piece of paper, that's a physical change because you haven't really changed the paper or the marker. Um, you could say, yes, the paper now is purple because I used a purple marker, but it hasn't really changed the essence of the paper. It's still paper. That's a physical change. Whereas a chemical change is one where something is changing permanently. It changes the chemical nature of the substance. So if I take that same piece of paper and I light it, put a flame to it, and it burns into ash, that paper has changed permanently. I can't get back the original paper that I had in the beginning. In fact, it has new and different properties. And so that's a chemical change. Um, and of course, I had to change the paper's chemical properties to make that change happen. So that's the two different kinds of changes in matter we are going to be looking at. Along with that, whether it fi be physical or chemical change, specifically chemical, is the law of conservation of mass. And that tells us that mass or matter cannot be created or destroyed during a chemical reaction. So if we have a certain amount of chemical in the beginning, and we perform a chemical reaction, we should have the same amount of that chemical at the end, or those elements of that chemical. So the mass at the beginning of the reaction equals the mass at the end of the reaction. So if I have 10 grams of reactants, I'm going to have 10 grams of products. They can't go somewhere. It has, we have to account for any loss of mass. Sometimes people think there's a loss of mass when chemicals produce a gas. But remember, gas is just a phase of matter, and it too has mass. And you have to add that in to the total mass of the system. Here's an example. It looks like it's long and complex, but it's really easy. It says, 10 grams of mercury-2 oxide is placed in an open flask and heated until it is converted to liquid mercury and oxygen gas. If the liquid mercury has a mass of 9.26 grams, what mass of oxygen is formed in this reaction? Hmm. Well, you notice we started with 10 grams of mercury oxide. That's in the beginning. At the end of the reaction, we have two products, mercury and oxygen. One of the products, the liquid mercury, is 9.26. So by subtraction, 10 minus 9.26. The number of grams that are different when you subtract is the mass of oxygen that's formed in the reaction. Again, the mass is the same at the beginning as it is at the end. So let's have you figure out if a change is chemical or it's physical. So I'm going to show you a picture. You're going to think about it, and then we're going to talk about it. Freezing of milk. Physical or chemical? Hopefully you said it's physical. Freezing, like melting and boiling and condensing, these are called phase changes. Phase changes are changes from one state of matter to another. So freezing is a physical change because we can get the unfrozen milk back. If you put milk in your freezer and it solidifies, you can always take it out and put it on the counter in the container and it will become a liquid once again. So freezing of milk is a physical change. Making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Hmm. Making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich is also a physical change. Now, think about it. Physical changes do not change the chemical composition of the material. If I am allergic to peanut butter, and I eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, I can tell you I'm still going to be allergic to that product that you see on this picture, because the peanut butter is still the problem for me. That means it hasn't changed chemically. The peanut butter, but butter is still the peanut butter, and the jelly, of course, is the jelly. You could argue that, yes, you couldn't really separate it easily, but it hasn't changed the essence of the material. So it's a physical change. How about hammering a nail? Obviously physical. We're not changing the nail. We're just changing its location. In the piece of wood, perhaps, or not in the piece of wood. 
like this graphic because we have little eggs frying in the pan. So you take an egg out of the container, and you put it into your pan, and you make, you can see here, looks like fried eggs. Physical or chemical? These are chemical changes. Now, of course, you can say they're fried eggs, and that's just our common language. But the egg, the essence of the egg, is different than it was before. In the beginning, the egg is runny. There's kind of a yellowish center and a clear outer shell, out, outer layer. Um, but now, once it's cooked, you see it's white on the outside. That can never go back to being the uncooked egg. So this is a chemical change. Most baking and cooking involves chemical changes. Not all, but many. Ah, here's the next one, cracking an egg open. Now you can see a little bit better the inside of a raw egg. What about cracking it open? Has it changed the essence of the egg? Nope, it has not. So this is a physical change. Some of you might argue, hey, I can't really get the egg back in, and I certainly can't uncrack the shell. That's true, but it hasn't changed the essence of the shell itself. Even if I take that eggshell and I crush it in my hand into tiny pieces, that's only physical change. Making a salad. Physical change, right? We, we're not changing the tomatoes or the lettuce or anything like that. So when you go to the salad bar, at lunch, and you put things on your plate, that's obviously just a physical change. However, sometimes if you take your food and you stick it in the panini maker and you are cooking the bread, you are toasting the bread, it's permanently altering it, that is a chemical change. So lunchtime can be a whole discussion of chemical and physical changes. How about boiling? Put some water on the stove and it boils. Physical. Remember, phase change is a physical change. Phase change. Change from boiling is liquid to a gas. Burning wood in a fireplace. Hmm. Think about a log in there. Or even maybe a fire pit. Or a bonfire if you've been to one. You're burning wood. What, what about chemical or physical? Hopefully you said chemical. Because, of course, that log, which was smooth wood, has gotten charred and it, it, it gives off some smoke and heat. Eventually it'll turn to ash, and those tiny pieces, of course, are quite different than the original piece of wood. We can't get that original wood back. Welding two pieces of metal together. So, like soldering something. So if you're in jewelry class and you are soldering some um, silver together to make a necklace or some earrings or something, what about that, physical or chemical? That's actually physical. Why is it physical? Because you're heating up a piece of metal to turn it into a liquid, and then it solidifies or hardens. That's just a phase change again. And the last one is kind of sad. A snowman melts. There it is. Kind of looks like Frosty the Snowman. But he'll come back again next year. Anyway, physical or chemical? Hopefully you said physical, because again, it's phase change, right? It's going from a solid to a liquid because of the heat of the sun, and um, it can always come back. Now, there are ways to separate some mixtures. Mixtures are things that are physically combined. Things that we can throw together um, are mixtures. They are not chemically combined. So there are different separation techniques that we're going to examine to help us separate mixtures. Here are two of them. We're going to look at filtration and distillation. We're going to do them one at a time. Filtration is probably something you're already familiar with. Filtration is the use of a funnel, a piece of filter paper in it, that collects solids. Here is a picture of it. I'm going to grab my pen. Let's see. So you can see the funnel is right here, there it is, and you fold up a piece of filter paper and it kind of lines the inside, and you notice what we have is a beaker, it says liquid and insoluble solid, that means some sort of solid product, it could uh, it'd be like sand and water, for example. As I pour this through here, the sand is going to catch on the filter paper, and the water, you can see here, is going to drip through. 
So you've successfully separated those two materials. Obviously, you'd have to have something that is a solid to do that. So things like sugar water would not be used for this because sugar dissolves in water. You probably already know that. And so if I made, mix sugar and water, you couldn't have pieces big enough to catch on the filter paper. But filtration is a very popular and easy technique. Again, for s in this case, solids and liquids where the solid can be caught. If you've ever seen a coffee maker, um, an old-fashioned kind, not one of those Keurigs, but the kind that have a filter in it that you then put some grinds in and the water passes through it. Essentially that's what happens. The water passes through over the coffee and it pulls some of the color through because it dissolves it slightly and um, that which falls through and goes into your cup is kind of a brown liquid and that is the filtrate, as you can see down here, that which is the filtered liquid. Another separation technique is distillation. Here's a distillation apparatus, and we probably will look at one of these in class. I will set that up, or maybe have one of you set it up. It's a pretty cool device, and essentially what you do is you use some heat, and you have a mixture here. Now, what do we use? How do we separate things by distillation? Like, what would be, what would the two things be? Distillation is separation by differences. in boiling point. So if two different substances have different boiling points, like nail polish remover and water, for example, if I mix those two things together, I can't see any pieces. I can't use filter paper to do that. How would I ever separate those out? I would use distillation. Nail polish remover boils at a lower temperature than water does. So uh, the mixture would be here in this round bottom flask. I would heat it up. Now, since the water boils second, it's a higher boiling point, the nail polish remover would begin to form a vapor. And it would be a gas. And I'm going to draw, attempt to draw a picture of a gas. Notice it's contained into this um, flask. Then what happens is there's the vapor. The vapor will come over here and then it will hit this long thin tube. The long thin tube has some water. You can see cool water in, water out. So there's water flowing around here in the condenser. And what happens is that vapor touches the cool water and of course when gases cool down they liquefy. That's exactly what happens. It liquefies and you can see the pink in this case. The drops coming out are the the recondensed vapor that was boiling off. So if there are two different boiling points, and they're pretty far away from each other, not one degree away, but you know five or ten degrees away, we can monitor with a thermometer what temperature is happening, and we can notice what um, material has that boiling point, because boiling point is an intensive property. It doesn't matter how much substance you have. So if we heat up this mixture, what will happen is we can separate it out um, and then collect the distillate, as it's called over here, and then we've um, successfully separated those two liquid mixtures. Other separations for mixtures. Crystallization is a separation of a solid in a liquid. So something like sugar and water, if you have ever had rock candy, um, that is something that has been crystallized. So these are just a picture of some crystals. You can crystallize things on string, you can crystallize it on a piece of um, wood, you can crystallize it on um, all kinds of things. Uh, I've done it on uh, uh, pipe cleaners. Um, the crystals fall out of solution and the liquid is left behind. So sugar water, which again, it would be hard to um, filter, it couldn't do it because the crystals have already dissolved. Um, if you allow the water to evaporate, eventually crystals will be left behind and you can put it on some collection medium or collect it at the bottom of the beaker. Chromatography is another method of separating a mixture. Here's a picture of one. 
Um, this probably is more of a biological um, picture, um, but it's showing a separation by differences in solubility. Now we'll definitely um, show you this in class, but chromatography, you know, in a mixture there are lots of different components. In this one you can see there are four components. This one, this one, this one, and this one. And what happens is they put a dot on a piece of paper, you can see it right down there, and they use some sort of a medium, meaning a um, material in which this substance is soluble. Something that's water soluble, for example, you could just use water. In any case, what happens is the water, as it, as it um, sits in, as this little piece of paper sits in water, the water wicks up, it pulls up along, you know, in this direction. Think about putting, um, you know, a piece of paper in a little bit of water. You notice that it'll like draw it up. It's the same kind of thing. It'll draw it up along here, and what'll end up happening is the material that is least soluble, that which doesn't dissolve very well, will come out first and that which is the most soluble will come out last and that's you can see and here's like a, a green color and an orange color and a darker orange and a yellow these are the four different components of that material right there that they placed on that piece of paper so we've successfully separated them into their component parts by a method called chromatography there's lots of different kinds of chromatography 